Okay, good evening, everybody. Sorry for the late start. What time is it? Oh my gosh, it's 5.41. I apologize for the late start. Uh, blame it on the Astros. Um, but this is day three of our first ever three-day Vital Voices Summit. Uh, this topic, as you know, is sex trafficking in Houston, hidden in plain sight. And uh, this event, there's another first for this event, and that this is the first time a Vital Voices event has been completely organized uh, and managed by a student, and that student is Rhonda Kirkendall. So uh, <laughs> literally everything involved in this uh, presentation for the past three days, getting the speakers, speaking to the speakers, looking at the PowerPoints, organizing content, all of that uh, was, was Rhonda. I, I tend to be a little bit of a control freak, but I just let it go, and I was very happy because she just did an absolutely amazing job. So we are going to start, we're gonna change up the order a little bit until our, our one of our speakers is parking, so he'll be here shortly. Uh, but I am gonna just turn it over to the magnificent Miss Kirkendall. Thank you, Mr. Villano. Welcome to UHD's Vital Voices, Sex Trafficking in Houston, Hidden in Plain Sight. We use the terminology hidden in plain sight because I want you to think about this for a minute. Over the next week or two weeks, both everybody here in person and everybody virtually, when you go and run your errands, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the nail salon, when you go to the post office, there are victims of sex trafficking hidden in plain sight around you. The goal of our seminar series this week, these three nights, is for us to be able to identify, know what to do, where to report. Yesterday, we had a long discussion about meeting the needs of survivors, including prosecuting traffickers, and then we heard the, the stories from three survivors. Tonight is a little bit different. We've heard a lot of information, and now we ask ourselves, what do we do with this information? As social workers, social justice advocacy is part of our core competencies, and that's something that we're all called to do. And I'm hopeful that tonight at the end of this evening, that each of you will know exactly what to do and how to engage in the policies that are you are most passionate about. The subject matter that we are going to be discussing tonight can be difficult. We are going to be discussing sex trafficking, uh, violence, and exploitation. If at any time, whether you are at home or in person, if you feel the need to get up, take a breath, get a drink of water, please feel free to do so. So this is uh, the bill signing. This past legislative session, we worked on uh, nine human trafficking bills and we were successful in getting them passed. If you look at Governor Abbott in the middle, if you follow him upright standing behind him, that's me. And so um, I had the pleasure of being invited to come to the bill signing. And so I'm on the right and the left. On the right, we were signing House Bill 390. House Bill 390 mandated that um, hotels, motels, commercial lodging, that the workers had to understand what sex trafficking is. So much of sex trafficking happens, and it was a personal story to my story, and that's why I work so closely on House Bill 390. On the left is a picture of all of us survivors with Governor Abbott, and we worked on the SMART Act. The SMART Act increased the ages of working in a strip club from the age of 18 to 21. Not only stripping, but also bartending, waiting staff. You cannot work in a strip club in Texas unless you're 21 years of age. I'm very passionate about this subject because as a survivor, I was told a couple decades ago now um, that I could not press charges against my perpetrator. I was passed what was called a statute of limitations. So a statute of limitations says that in Texas, when you pass a certain time frame, you're no longer to press charges. In Texas, for child sexual assault, it was 10 years from your 18th birthday. I was older than 28 years old, so I was told, too bad, too sad. I bought a Lobbying 101 book, literally bought a Lobbying 101 book, and drove myself to Austin. I learned it the hard way, the School of Hard Knocks, and we're hoping that y'all don't have to do the same thing. It took me five years, over two legislative sessions, and the statute of limitations was abolished for child sexual assault, it went into effect September of 2007. So, so this evening, 
This evening, uh, you are going to hear from three amazing nonprofits at work in the greater Houston area, and they all have public policy teams. I learned a trick, and the trick is I'm an individual, and I don't have the knowledge, I don't have the background, I don't have the connections at the Capitol to understand what's going on. But if you partner with nonprofits that have public policy teams, they need your help. They want your help. They're willing to educate you. And if you call Jamie and if you call Lindsay and you call Jacqueline and ask for information on legislation, they'll help you. They want, want our help. So Jamie is actually, uh, he works for Street Grace. Um, and Carruthers, Jamie Carruthers has co-authored and presented a variety of continuing legal education courses on trafficking and related issues, which he has delivered to national law firms as well as state and national NGOs and associations. He has also co-authored many publications on the issue of trafficking, including articles in peer-reviewed journals. Carruthers has consulted on anti-trafficking legislation in numerous states and also federal legislation. Please welcome Jamie Carruthers. Well, thank you so much, Rhonda, and uh, thank you all for being here tonight and listening to me. Right here. Button on the right. Button on the right. Got it. Even I can handle that. Looking at my picture, I actually think I'm wearing the same suit in that picture as I am right <laughs> now. I wish I had worn the same tie. I've been like, what's going on here? <clears throat> so yeah, I'm the director of policy at Street Grace. I work um, for a number of years. I work for Children at Risk as their senior staff attorney worked in Texas. Now I work in Texas, also in Georgia and in Tennessee. So some of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight, we're not just trying this in Texas. We're doing it in other states as well. We're probably putting a little bit of a spin on it. Every state's a little bit different, you know, and how they do things and what their codes look like and what their laws look like. But it's really what we're talking about is we're moving the biggest lever we have, right? And that's the law. And when you move, when you move that lever, everything underneath it has to kind of shift as well, generally. And so it's not, it won't fix everything. There isn't a legislative solution for everything. And even when there is, you know, we live in an imperfect wall, an imperfect world. And the legislation is an imperfect vehicle. We can just try to get people moving in the right direction and make sure that certain specific outcomes are good. And we look for things that will more or less systemically uh, change people. To be more, for example, compassionate towards those who are in the life, right? Be more punitive towards those who are out there driving the market by purchasing sex. Um, making sure that, you know, both in real life and online, we have protections in place to keep minors from being exploited. But to tell you a little bit about Street Grace, our mission is to eradicate the commercial exploitation of children, CSEC, and our vision is a world where children are free from, so all children are free from sexual exploitation. I'm going to talk a lot about adults too tonight in this. A lot of the legislation that I do is with adults. There's two reasons for that. Um, <clears throat> the first is majority of people who are in trafficking, well, looking at the studies that have been done, regional studies in America that mainly focused on female, uh, females and prostitution. Looking at all of those studies, the majority of women in prostitution, and you could probably say people in prostitution, um, entered into that life as a minor, right? With a common age of entry being around 16, right? So over 50% started in prostitution um, as minors. And over half had been or were being trapped at the time these studies were done. And so what we're talking about is when people start aging up, it's like we can't say, oh, it's street grace. We would have cared about you two years ago when you were 16. But now that you're 18, we don't care. Of course we do. Of course we do. The majority of trafficking victims are going to experience trafficking as a minor, whether or not they're an adult now. And the other reason is the systems that allow children to be exploited, they exploit, they exploit adults too. So whether we're talking about online buyer sites, um, whether we're talking uh, about hotels that are complicit or businesses that are complicit or how pimps recruit, these same systems implicate adults as well. And we don't say, okay, well, you're an adult now, we no longer care about you. Um, I think you'll probably have a good grounding in human trafficking, so I cut all of those slides out. Just a reminder, we talk about commercial sexual exploitation of children. We're talking about any sexual activity involving a minor when something is, where something is given or promised. That doesn't have to be money, it could be food, it could be housing, it could be drugs, um, it could be any sorts of things. That's commercial sex, that's trafficking of children, right? And another concept that you may have heard already um, over the past two, two or three days is the concept of demand or the concept of the demand market. I'm going to refresh you on this really quickly because it's important to everything that we do. We're an anti-demand organization. If you look at the human trafficking marketplace, oh, sure. If you look at the human trafficking marketplace, I tend to wander. 
it's like any other market. And if you're if you're an economy, if you're a economics major, don't don't come at me. But it's like any other market. In the most crudest, most simple form, you've got a supply of something, you've got a way to transmit that, to distribute it to people who want it, and then you've got a consumer base that buy it, right? Sex traffic market is no place, in this no different. And in this case, our supply is actually people, right? It's people who are being sold for sex or labor services. It's being facilitated or marketed or middlemanned by pimps, right? That's what they do. That's what the traffickers are. They are that distribution network. And of course, your third side of the triangle, your consumer base. Now, when we look at fighting human trafficking in Texas, historically, you know, over our entire history until very recently, we focused almost entirely on the supply. Arrest those prostitutes. Clean up this and that. Get that track cleaned up. Arrest those. Arrest them. Arrest them again. Put them in prison. And of course, this did absolutely nothing to address the problem. Did nothing to, uh, to address the underlying social issues that were driving this. Revictimized victims, and of course, the pimps rarely got prosecuted. And that's uh, that's still true today. Some things have changed, though. Um, we kind of pivoted into more of a go after the trafficker model, which is great, right? We do want to put traffickers in jail, under the jail. I'm pretty flexible on this. Um, we want them prosecuted, we want them arrested, we want them put away. We're firmly behind that. A lot of culpability there. Um, however, we will never, ever arrest our way out of this problem by arresting traffickers, ever. They choose this criminal profession because it is so insulated and so low risk and so lucrative, right? Successful prosecutions, although Harris County um, is doing a lot to pioneer cases that don't require this, they often hinge on victim testimony, right? And a lot of misconceptions about victims are ready, they're ready to rush into the arms of police and be taken away. They want to help. They've been victimized. No, they want their, their, their people. They are individuals with a lot of trauma, oftentimes substance abuse problems, uh, a history of victimization, and their instinct is to run. It's not to sit around. It's not to stick around town and see their pimp get brought to justice, whoever he or she is. You know, it's to get out of there, to just get out of there. And so when you're building cases that are built on people who don't, maybe they want to see justice, they don't want to see this happen to other people, but they just can't handle it, right? They're very hard cases to prosecute. So that leaves us with the consumer base. Well, that's what we believe Texas and Texas is aiming at. The men, and it's all men, right? I've looked at over 10,000 arrest records. I've never seen a female buyer who are driving this market. They drive it completely with their money because they want to be able to purchase someone else for sex. And they use all kinds of justifications and rationales for doing this. But the bottom line is they're catchable, right? They're not criminal masterminds. They're culpable. Oh, absolutely, they are culpable. And that's the biggest change in Texas we've seen is this belief that, yes, buyers are responsible for this. And they're doing a bad thing. And they're doing it willingly. Under, unlike the prostitute individual, uh, they're doing this willingly. And they have something to lose as well, right? Well, sometimes quite a bit to lose. And so when we look at collapsing the trafficking market, we're not going to do it by arresting prostitutes. We've tried that for 200 years. We're not going to do it by arresting pimps, no matter how much money. I, I literally, it would take an astonishing amount of money and manpower to make a sizable dent in trafficking by going after pimps. But buyers, oh, they're out there. And they are catchable. They're deterrable. And once it's proven, once you start arresting people and prosecuting people, uh, the crime decreases. Will it ever go away? No. You know, that's the reality of it. Can we make it much, much, much less prevalent? Oh, yes, we can do that. So when you change the policy, I kind of cover this. <clears throat> Just real quick, um, real quick refresh or two, and then I'm going to move into, into the legislation. In Texas, there's actually something that happens before this happens on the chart. You see where it says introduce the bill or file the bill, whatever you're doing with that bill where you're filing it. Um, before that happens, the legislator will take her bill, his or her bill idea whether it's fully drafted out in perfect language or if it's written on a cocktail napkin, and they'll give it to legislative council, which is a room, a building full of lawyers in, in Austin, and they turn that into a bill and they, they cross-check it with other codes and they cross all the T's and they do all these things. They give it to the legislator, the legislator files it. And once it gets filed, it gets referred to committee. Now in the House, of course we have the House and we have the Senate in Texas. In the House, the Speaker of the House decides what, where, what committee your bill is gonna go in front of, okay? In the Senate, the um, Lieutenant Governor decides what committee your bill is going to go to. Regardless, under the Texas Constitution, those two things have to happen. If you go to file a bill and you're a legislator, whether you've got 50 years of experience or this is your first term, that bill gets filed. Same thing with referring to a committee. Those things have to happen. The next thing does not have to happen, and this is where bills die. 
They go into committee. The committee, the committee chair and the committee has to decide to give your bill a hearing, right? The bill has to have a hearing. It cannot move forward without a hearing on that bill inside committee. A small room about this size, about this many people in it. You got all your legislators up here. You've probably seen it on, you can watch it on uh, Texas legislature online if you're curious. Um, but it has to have that hearing. If it doesn't have a hearing, easiest way to kill a bill, just never gets a hearing. That's it. Bill's dead. You know, the end of May. That's it. Or it can get a hearing, but if it gets a hearing, committee hearing, the next one, it has to be reported out. It has to, the committee has to vote on it, report it out. Maybe they change it a little, maybe they like it the way it is, but it has to come out. If it doesn't come out, it's left pending. Again, your bill has died. You got the courtesy of a hearing, thank you for that, but now your bill has died. If it does make it out of that committee, it goes into what's called the calendars committee on, in the House. The Senate does not have a calendars committee. They're way too fancy for that. But in the House, um, they have one. And the calendars committee exists only because every bill, once it comes out of committee, has to go in front of everybody, you know, on the floor, and they get to vote on it and talk about it. That can't, and you can imagine, last session, anybody want to guess how many bills got filed last session? Just anybody want to take a wild guess? Anybody? 300. 300? Anybody else? Very closer. 9,999 bills got filed last session. So if you're filing a bill, you've got a one in 10,000 shot of getting that bill to pass. Uh, but they've got to schedule all these bills and get them on a calendar and get them floor voted. I can't imagine what it's like. Calendars committee does that. And of course, that's an easy place for a bill to die. Even a good bill, even a bill that's liked can die in calendars simply because there isn't enough time. Education bills, budget bills, property tax bills. These bills have to be heard and they have to go through and then kind of everything else gets a chance as well. And so it can die in calendars. Then it goes to the House floor, amendments, debate, it's engrossed. Then the whole process starts over in the Senate. So it's this constant shepherding, calling people, going to hearings, making office visits, this whole thing on both sides to finally get your bill um, through. And you, of course, you have to do all this stuff um, and you have to kind of shepherd it as much as you can every step of the way uh, to have any chance of the bill passing. And of course, you know, it's easy to say in February, even in March, even in March, things are kind of normal. Come April, oh my gosh, things are spiraling out of control. Come May, everyone you talk to on the phone in Austin hasn't slept in days, right? They're all just, they're all just going insane. And committee meetings are lasting all night. Um, it becomes a real, it becomes really something. Um, I talked a little bit about Texas Legislature Online. That's TLO, that's the address right there, but just Google Texas Legislature Online. You can find all this good stuff. There's videos doing a better job than I did of explaining how it becomes law, how to follow a bill. You can watch committees live, all that kind of good stuff. That's what it looks like. It's actually a really, really quality website our state has put together. Um, I'm gonna talk really, really, really briefly about a bill that we had passed in Illinois. I don't really work in Illinois. I got a call from the legislature and I worked on him on this. Um, seeing this in Illinois code was like, you know, the science fiction movies where you, the scientists stumble upon a, an island where there's still dinosaurs living. That's kind of like what this was. This, Illinois still had a mistake of age defense for buyers, which meant, oh, I thought she looked 18 to me, Your Honor. Look at her. Does she, do, look, look at the way she's dressed. Does she look 18? Come on, she looks, does she look 15? She looks 30, doesn't she? That kind of thing, which Texas got rid of, uh, gosh, well, well more than 15 years ago. We got rid of mistake of age defense, but that doesn't fly. Um, but Illinois still had it, so we got rid of that. And the reason I'm bringing it up um, is not to brag about it, but because and this is a little, I mean, you bear with me, you're gonna be a little complicated, but there's a group out there called the American Law Institute. And the American Law Institute does nothing but exist to create model codes. Everything you can think of in government has a code. The ins there's an insurance code, there's a blue sky code, which is for stocks. There's an agriculture code, there's a criminal code, or we call it the penal code. All these codes for everything the government does, right? Well, ALI puts out model codes. They don't have the force of law, they just exist. And states can pick them up and be like, wow, you know, our Golly, our civil procedure code is so out of date. Let's use theirs. It was put together by the best lawyers in the country, so we're going to use theirs. And that's how they do it. And it gets taught in law school. Model penal codes get taught in law school because a lot of times law professors are like, well, none of you guys are going to stick around probably our state. You're probably going to go practice elsewhere. Let's learn the model code, which kind of touches on everything. And judges will use it. They'll be like, oh, Texas law left a gap here. We're going to, we're going to go to the model code and kind of look at that and use that. Well, they put out the sexual assault chapter chapter the sexual assault chapter codes this July. We want every state that we work in to put out a resolution rejecting it. Why? They bring back the mistake of age defense. Secondly, 
under the model penal code sexual assault chapter, the sex offender registry becomes invisible to everyone, including victims. So if you're concerned there might be a sex offender in your neighborhood or by your kid's school, well, you can't look that up. Or if you're the victim of a sexual assault, you can't find out where that person is. So it's, it's, it's quite shocking. And again, I don't think any danger of saying, oh yeah, we're gonna adopt this, but we wanna send a message. We wanna send a message to the ALI that this, this is not victim friendly. Um, this is actually victim punitive and we won't take it. Um, so this is our legislative agenda. I think I'm running out of time, so I wanna move through this pretty quickly. But these are the bills. I'm gonna go through each one really, really quickly um, and ask y'all to support these. And of course, you can contact me anytime and I can talk about um, where the bills are and stuff. But Prostitution Safe Harbor, which is also called the Safe Reporter. Very, very easy, very straightforward bill. It says that if a person comes forward to report a crime, either against themselves or that they've witnessed, anything that they say in that crime report related to prostitution can't be used against them. So they could literally say, I was at the hotel turning tricks. The guy beat me, raped me, and robbed me, left me for dead. What were you doing at the hotel? I was, I was prostituting. Okay, go, we'll go find him. This is, you know, the difficulties of bringing this bill forward are one, law enforcement thinks we're taking a stab at them and saying, you're gonna to wanna to arrest people who try to report crime. And they're like, that's not true, that's not true. Well, maybe it isn't true. You know, if you ask survivors, they may not believe that. But the point is the people in the life do not believe it's true. They do not believe they can come forward and talk to the police. We wanna put it in black letter law. You can come forward, you can talk to the police and they can't arrest you. Service providers like the landing will be able to say, look, it's right here in black letter law. This happened to you, we need to file a police report. It also ties in with the fact that sex buying is now a felony in Texas on the first offense. So police should want to get these reports. They're like, hey, we got him for a felony automatically. But now we can get him for what other, other, other felonies he had. And so we are very much want to bring forward prostitution safe harbor to build a bridge between exploited persons and the police, and also to allow exploited people to report crime that's committed against them. The second one is survivor employment. This is going to be a tricky bill. This problem is bill, I'll be totally frank with you guys. I kind of expect to make it more of a statement piece, and we're going to come back and try it again later. But it could pass. You never know. This bill would give a 2.5K, $2,500 tax break to any company that hires a human trafficking survivor, whether sex or labor. Um, it comes off our franchise tax. In Texas, businesses pay a franchise tax, but it doesn't kick in until about 1.25 million in revenue. So small businesses never pay effectively any franchise tax. Anybody here has run a small business, you probably maybe never had to pay any franchise tax, um, unless you were very successful. What we obviously what we're trying to do here is incentivize businesses to give survivors a chance, right? Give us, give, it has to be full-time employment, it has to be over minimum wage. Um, and then of course they get $2,500 a year back for every year they employ that person. The issue that we're having is coming up and we're having a pretty robust discussion about it is how this gets handled internally within companies. Some survivors are very out and proud. You know, they will tell you their story. That's a big part of their identity. Others, it's none of your business. I get that, right? Um, and so everybody's different and not everybody wants everybody to know this. And so how we are going to keep it confidential during the hiring process is what I'm working with legislators now. A lot of people really like the concept of this bill. It's the idea of getting past that issue of how it gets handled inside of companies. School information security, another pretty straightforward bill. This one isn't exactly human trafficking, but it came from a story or from an anecdote that I was told uh, by a constable in um, Montgomery County, they had a predator who was stalking a girl. He followed her to cheerleading practice. He knew when her, where, her, where her bus dropped her off. He knew all this stuff because it was all on the school district's website, right? It was right there. When all the practices were, you could click a link and go to the bus routes, whether, you know. And so not every district school district is wildly different. I mean, maybe only a handful of schools are going to have this on their websites, but if they do, we don't want it there. We want it behind a password wall. Um, at my kid's school, Everything is behind a password wall. Not all schools are like this. We want to mandate it. And what we're saying is, if the public isn't invited to it, put it behind a password. Put it behind a, put it behind a password. If the public is invited to it, put it on the front. We don't care. So like football games, theater performances, dance recitals, these sorts of things. Of course, advertise it to the public all you want. But the rehearsals, the practices, uh, these sorts of things where you know weirdos can't just wander up. No, no. We want that behind password protection with bus routes as well. We're also working on a bill for online grooming. This is another way of saying child enticement. I think we've all 
heard a lot of stories, seen it in the news. A guy pretends to be, pretending to be a modeling agent is a big one, right? Pretending to be a record producer or in some kind of glamorous industry, right? Where you're enticing girls, particularly girls, to come away from home and meet you somewhere because they're so beautiful and they're so talented and you, you saw their videos on YouTube and oh my gosh, you can't wait to make them a star. Um, what we are proposing, we have a child enticement law right now in Texas. There's two problems with it. One, it's very custody focused, right? The law, and I'm sure this is how it gets used, mainly 90% of the time, an aggravated spouse or ex-spouse takes the kid and goes, right? They're gonna use this, they're gonna use Texas's child, current child enticement law to do that. You're taking that child away from the spouse that has custody. Um, it also works for sexual predators, but you've got to prove, you've got to prove that the person lured that person away from the house with the intent of committing, and then it's got this laundry list of crimes. You know, child pornography, child rape, any, any of these crimes, you've got to prove they had the intent to do that. We want to do something that's pre-harm, right? We want something that doesn't come into play um, after the child has been lured, after the child's been taken, after the child's been abused and exploited and trafficked. And then it's like, oh, we got you now with that child enticement law. We want something that police can use now before that harm happens. So if an adult under this law, if an adult contacts a child, attempts to entice them or attempts to get them to leave their domicile, and in doing so makes any fraudulent representation, of course I own a modeling studio. Well, yes, I'm a big record executive. Of course, I'm a talent, I'm a talent scout for a movie. Um, report this to the police, the police can go investigate this guy. If that's not true, well, you know, it's gonna be a class A misdemeanor. And by the way, we're just gonna keep investigating you now. You're on our radar. We know who you are. There is no reason for an adult man to contact an underage girl at all, who he doesn't know almost, especially not if he's making fraudulent misrepresentations about what he's doing and why he's contacting her. So we feel like this bill will be constitutionally sound because there are First Amendment concerns with stuff like this. And we think it will give police a tool to start investigating. When you look at your kids, um, Instagram, I'm just, you know, like I, and you, or whatever, and you're seeing all these DMs from some guy, um, when you contact the police, if this is passed, they can actually do something rather than, well, you, should, you know, because they're not gonna be able to do much as it is. And the last one, of course, is the model penal code rejection. We want a resolution saying, no thank you, ALI, do better, ALI, we don't want this, ALI. Um, we are a victim friendly state, we respect and care for and love. Um, vulnerable populations here in Texas. We are not here to protect sexual predators. We are here to protect the vulnerable. Um, so it's gonna be almost like a joint resolution, which means both the House and the Senate join in to carry it. Just a quick word on resolutions. Um, in Texas, they don't carry the force of law or in any state, they don't carry the force of law. You can't resolve to do something and that's the law. It's used a lot to recognize things or people. Um, it's used a lot to declare things. It's used to set the stage for legislation. Um, we want to send a very public message, right? Oh, I had, one, I had one more. And the last one is a record ceiling fix. And I feel like I'm probably really running out of time. Is that correct, Stephen? We've got two minutes? Sweet. Um, in Texas, it's our shame, our, it's the shame of our state, I will tell you this right now, is we don't have a vacator law in past. We call it vacator, mother states call it vacature. Um, that simply means a vacator is, okay, I've been convicted of a crime. I'm a criminal. I've been convicted, but later on it comes out, I didn't actually do it. They proved it through DNA evidence or something else. I could be able, should be able to process for me to vacate that crime. Meaning not only, it's not expunged, it's not um, hidden, it's not sealed, it's not put away, it's not, not anything, it's gone. It's completely gone. It never should, like it never happened because it never should have happened. A lot of states have vacators for sex trafficking victims um, because they're gonna rack up Multiple com multiple convictions, often for prostitution. It's on the fourth arrest for prostitution. It's a felony. I work with a survivor, Allie Franklin. Um, she's got 11, 11 felony level prosti prostitution convictions, and she's by she's not close to being an outlier, right? This is very common. They make them mule drugs. They make them do other things. They're constantly around criminals doing criminal things. They have arrest records, right? And they're being compelled to do this. So you would think we'd be able to Texas be able to say, look, we proved that he or she is a human trafficking victim. Let's get rid of all this. Well. I've tried unsuccessfully for going on 10 years to get that done. What we have done is create a record seal, a streamlined process for survivors to apply to have the records sealed. So only certain people can see them. State agencies can see them, law enforcement can see them, but normal people can't, employers can't look it up, that sort of thing. It's not ideal, it's not justice, but it's what we have. And we do have a pretty good streamlined process with it. The problem we have with it 
is that in Texas, if you have a finding of family violence on your record, you can never have anything sealed ever. Ever, never, never, not only that, but anything. It's off the table for you as a remedy. The problem with that is family violence doesn't mean what you're probably thinking it does. Like, I got in a fist fight with my aunt. Well, that would be family violence. But it means anybody who lives in the same residence as you is your family for family violence purposes. So if you get in a fight over the last fish stick with your roommate, the police come and you get arrested, they're going to be like, oh, assault, oh, finding a family violence. You can only imagine if you're, a, if you're in the life, surrounded by other girls who are in the life, surrounded by pimps, surrounded by criminals, surrounded by buyers, um, police are an everyday part of your life. Conflict, drugs, all these sorts of things, criminals doing criminal things around you constantly, police are much more involved in your life than they would be in a normal person's life. Arrests will happen. And even when, even when, say it's a case of where the pimp is abusing the trafficking victim, 99 times out of 100, she's going to take the fall for that pimp when the, when the police come. We see that with domestic violence as well. Of course, there's no difference no difference in a trafficking situation. So what you're going to wind up with as a trafficking victim is the majority of them in Texas are going to have some crime that has a family violence finding because it's so broad and encompasses so much. Um, and then despite the fact that we have the special record sealing thing in Texas for them, well, they can't even use it. They're on the outside. They're looking in. They're not going to get it. We want a very simple fix. It says a finding of family violence will not preclude you from using the record sealing fix we gave survivors back in 2019. Um, I'm pretty optimistic about this. We'll see. You'd be, you'd be kind of surprised and amazed how much opposition there is um, to this kind of remedies for, for survivors in Texas, but that's what we have. That's all my ledge. I think I'm out of time, but uh, will we do questions at the end or yeah. at the end? Okay. And that's it. That is my email um, and, my, and I put my cell phone on there. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. It's where we're most active, most active on Facebook. Uh, we do a lot of ledge posting, so if you want to sign up, um, and follow, be able to follow legislation not only here in Texas, but in Georgia and Tennessee as well. I'm serious about the email. If you have questions about ledge or policy, um, feel free to email me. Um, I, will, I will respond. I enjoy talking about this with people. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jamie. It is, always amazes me how he takes a complicated process and makes it manageable. And I say manageable because I know when you see these diagrams of the legislative process, it seems daunting. What I would ask is if you really want to get engaged in the legislative process, once the legislature starts, this session, the 88th, starts on January 10th, find a bill that you're interested in. Find something that you really want to know what happens to it as it goes through that process. You can go to what is called TILO or Texas Legislature Online. Jamie showed you a picture of it. You can find that bill and every single step that that bill goes through, you'll get an email notification. Begin to follow that bill and see, you know, look at the diagram and watch it go through the process. When it comes to a committee hearing, you can go and speak in support of it or against it. Um, you're typically given about three minutes to speak. That is not a lot of time. And so if they have too many speakers, the um, chairman of the committee may say, hey, now everybody has one minute to speak. So you just always have to prepare. But as you get more familiar and you watch the legislative process through your bill, you begin to understand what it's like. Jamie also mentioned how at the end of the legislative process, those last few days, everything speeds up. Uh, you could ask my husband who's in the audience, those last few days, what you're going to do is you're going to find me at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. I'm on my laptop. I've got the House on one side, the Senate on one side, my bills for um, foster care kids, my bills for human trafficking, and I'm watching where everything goes. Um, I this may sound nerdy, but it is really quite exciting to work in this process as well. And so now I'm, we're going to transition over and I'm going to introduce you to Lindsay Wilkerson. Lindsay serves as the Associate Director of the Children's Immigration Network and the Senior Coordinator of the Texas Family Leadership Council at Children at Risk. She advocates for policies that positively impact the lives of Texas children with a focus on immigrant children. Welcome, Leslie. Let Lindsay. Go. 
Is that better? So Children at Risk is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. And so part of our mission is to end childhood poverty. And so we do that through strategic research, uh, public policy analysis, really looking at the data to be able to inform policy. And we look at the whole child. So that includes issues such as early childhood education, K through 12 education, human trafficking, parenting, health and nutrition, immigrant children, the whole gamut. So anything that's impacting Texas children and their families we're looking at. So to start, I thought we would do a little pop quiz. Um, so just to see kind of where everyone's at and how much everyone knows before we get into the presentation. Um, so we can do thumbs up, thumbs down based on what you think the answer is for each of the questions. So the first one is, how often is the Texas legislature in session? So if you think it's every year, thumbs up. I see some thumbs down. OK, that's right. It's every two years. Our next one is, how long is each regular Texas legislative session? So for 90 days, thumbs up. For 140. Okay, thumbs, I see some thumbs down. It's B, 140 days. True or false, anyone can submit testimony at a public hearing. If you think that's true, thumbs up. Yes, y'all were paying attention. How many House and Senate bills were filed during the 87th legislative session? Jamie mentioned this briefly earlier. Who was paying <laughs> Good, y'all are listening, thumbs down. So it was actually 9,999 and the 1,073 were how many bills made it to Governor Abbott's desk. Who knows uh, best what Texas children need? Is it A, state lawmakers, B, nonprofit advocacy groups, or C, none of the above? Yeah, so I see some Cs, that's a hard one because there's more than two options. But I would say it's seen in the above. It's not just going to be state lawmakers or advocacy groups. It's going to be the collective and also children and families as well who are going to know what's best for Texas children. According to Texas voters, where does education rank among the most important problems facing the state today? I see some thumbs down for fifth. That's correct. It's actually 10th. So some of the other issues that were in the top 10 are immigration, the economy, abortion, gun violence, climate change, health care, the grid, property taxes, and voting. What percentage of Texans said they felt the state was headed in the right direction? 40% or 36%? All right, I see thumbs down for 40%. That's correct. It's 36% feel that the state is headed in the right direction. So this is the same, very similar. I think it might be the exact same as you saw in Jamie's presentation. So I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, but a lot of the work that we do is prior to a bill being introduced is working with partners, strategizing over those key issues to be able to do that research before bills are introduced and then finding those sponsors to be able to introduce the bill into the House or the Senate. And then as Jamie mentioned, some of the different parts of the process and how important that is to whether a bill is gonna die or whether it's gonna continue to move forward. And so really staying involved and seeing what's going on, and this can be super important in terms of advocacy and the awareness that you can do around a bill. So this was mentioned as well, the Texas Legislature Online. So this is the website. And if you go here, you can figure out who represents you. There's a lot more detail on how a bill becomes a law. They have a very detailed like one pager on the entire process. So if you have any questions, it's a great resource to use. And you can also follow any bills that you're interested in, search by topics. It has all the important dates that you need to know about for the upcoming legislative session and any hearings that are also going to be happening. So this is what it looks like. And you can see at the top where the arrow is pointing to search legislation. You could type in a word or a phrase and it would then populate with the different bills that relate to 
that phrase that you typed in. You could also use that to look up any of the bills that we've mentioned today that are in Texas. You can also change it if you see by the where it says 84R, you can change it by year in the session. And so you could easily find bills from previous sessions to see what was happening in the state and where it went in the process. So it's a great resource to use and you can also tag things when you create an account so it's easier to track stuff and be able to look up by different individuals. It's a great tool. I highly recommend using it if you're interested in any legislation for the upcoming session. So to recap, I'm going to go over a couple past sessions of some of the bills that relate to human trafficking. And so this is from the 86th session. So this was in 2019. Um, so one of them was SB 20. And SB refers to Senate bill and HB, as you heard earlier, is House bill, uh, just for terminology. And then Huffman, that's one of the um, representatives who was on that as a sponsor. So just so you're understanding how it's listed out, what that means. And so this was an omnibus bill. And it was really the start of working towards what is being called the Texas model. And so this um, made that buyers of commercial sex now face state jail felony on their second offense. And then there was also the non-disclosure for victims um, to be able to move forward with their lives after. Um, another one of these is HCR 35, which is a House concurrent resolution. And as was mentioned, this isn't a new law, but it really can drive funding and signal to what the state is interested in, what they're wanting to invest in. And this is really important to be able to know. So there's a couple others, as you can see on here, one of them, um, HB 403 that required human trafficking training for superintendents and trustees. And this one was also a great item that, you know, really helped provide the background and um, making sure that they're up to date on what's going on in terms of being aware, being mindful of what's happening in the schools and also any changes in policy. So for the 87th session, um, this is HB 1540. And so an important part of this was that it broke out the provision of buying being a, um, breaks out prostitution, excuse me, and buying as a separate offense. Um, so that was something that was really important about this. And then it also amended the human trafficking statute um, by adding some of the corrosive elements, which was a win. HB 390, um, this one Rhonda mentioned earlier, and this was about the training for in the hospitality industry. So looking at um, those who are working in hotels and motels and requiring them to receive an annual training and new employees to receive that training within a certain number of days of them being hired. Um, this was seen as something that's important just because the hospitality really should be considered as a first line reporter. And so making sure that they have the tools necessary and the training necessary to be able to do that as well. Still in the 87th session. So these are more prevention bills. Um, one of these Rhonda mentioned as well, which was that businesses, um, they couldn't employ anyone under the age of 21 and you couldn't be under the age of 18 and even be allowed to be on the premise of one of these institutions. So that was um, really interesting when they were having some of the testimony on this and to be able to hear people come forward, um, those with their personal experience being able to um, provide that experience and that background on why they felt that this was so important. And so to see that pass is a huge win. Um, this also, the SB 1831, this required uh, trafficking prevention in driver's ed courses. So this I think is super important, especially when we're looking at the younger age group to be able to provide that information to that age demographic as well and to have that be a requirement that everyone is getting exposed to is really great. This also 
um, required signage in schools, hospitals, a whole host of places that are listed on here. And those were um, signs that listed the heightened penalties. And then also they were provided in English and Spanish and they had to be on the premise at all of these locations within a certain distance from the entrance to these buildings. So again, just as much awareness and attention you can draw to some of these things is super important. So some of the survivor services, um, so HB 2633, this created a grant that was able to provide the funding to support programs that would provide evidence-based trauma treatment, housing, and other long-term care for survivors. And then as you can see, uh, HB 42, this was the funds are only for official purposes of the attorney representing for the state or law enforcement, but this covers the cost of a contract with a municipal or city program to provide these services to survivors, um, domestic survivors of trafficking. So some of the missed opportunities, which unfortunately there always are those, um, was HB 2803, and so this was really to incentivize um, landlords and property owners and to have them have a little bit more skin in the game. However, there was fear that this could pit landlords and tenants against each other. And so this was something that did not move forward. The next one, um, HB 2629, so this mandated the registration of all privately owned white label ATMs. And so if you don't know what a white label ATM is, those are private owned and operated ATMs. So they're not with the bank, they're a non-bank entity and they do not have to be registered. So there's not a lot of oversight to those. Um, however, as you can imagine, that would have an impact on the industry to then have to register your ATM and to be able to have that additional level of oversight. So there was some pushback on that. And then with HB 162, there's actually some research that shows juvenile justice correlating with a higher risk of being victimized. And, you know, we really don't want to re-victimize those that have already been victimized at one point. And so this was also something um, that was a disappointment, but, you know, finding ways to continue to move forward and what are other angles to be able to approach some of these issues from when you're experiencing roadblocks. So this is actually um, a little more in depth on HB 2629. And so it talks about that there's over 900 IMBs in the state of Texas and Children at Risk actually has a map of IMBs in their proximity to schools in the state. And so I encourage you to check out the map. It's really interesting to see. I've had friends who have wanted to get like reflexology done and they're like, the place seems a little bit sketchy. I'm not sure. And I'm like, look on the map, see if they're <laughs> listed on there as an IMB. And then you know that, hey, this isn't the kind of establishment that I want to be supporting because it's an IMB. And so finding somewhere else to go. Some other additional um, missed opportunities were SB 442. And this really, there's a whole laundry list of deceptive practices. And this was really to try and address some of those. Um, currently, only the AG can uh, collect penalty fees. And so this really would have incentivized local attorneys to be able to bring these civil suits. Um, however, that is something that we're looking at in this upcoming session. So I'll talk more about that later. And then HCR2, that just would have been a great way to be able to do more research on the effects of pornography. So this did pass in special session um, and this really just the only challenge with it is that it's an opt-in, so you have to be able to check that box rather than opt out, 
which can be challenging to make sure that kids are then receiving this education, particularly if they're in a home where they are experiencing trafficking from their caregiver. So these are some of our policy priorities for the upcoming session. So to protect and end demand and then increase penalties. So a couple of these that I think are interesting, as you can see, a couple of these are similar to ones that did not pass or missed opportunities. Um, like the first one and then white label ATMs, something that is new, that's similar to what Jamie had mentioned um, and one of theirs in Illinois that had passed was uh, the disabilities. So adding protections for adult victims with significant disabilities. So I think that will be, there's been a couple of cases that have come forward and they're really trying to find a way to be able to prosecute those and support these survivors but they haven't been able to do so. And so this would help with that. Um, and then also increasing um, child pornography sentences. So for example, it'd be a felony third degree if you had less than 100 images, felony second degree if you had 100 or more, but less than 500, or you had previously been convicted in a felony first degree if you had two or more previous offenses or had over 500 images in your possession. So how to get involved in advocacy. So for us, we send out advocacy alerts on all of our bills, the things that we're working on, letting you know what's going on, where we're at in the process. If there's a sign on that we want you to help sign on to bring attention to ways that you can engage. So this is great to stay up to date on what's happening at the legislature. Also vote, because as we know, all of the people at the state legislature, they're elected representatives. And so if we're not voting, then we're not having representatives that are going to reflect our interests at the Capitol. So here's some important dates just to be aware of. You can also do personal visits. You can meet with staff. You can um, bring one pager, share information. If you're an expert in an issue or you're really interested in advocating for something, this is a great way to get involved, to better inform yourself, to know what's happening and to continue to push for policies that are gonna help um, Texas children and families. You can also attend public hearings and testimony. All of this you can find on the website, on the TLO website. They have the hearings. You can view those online. I know during the workday, I constantly have them on in the background and I'm watching what's happening. So it's a great way to stay informed. You can also, as was mentioned, provide testimony as well, written and oral. So if you're going to give testimony, again, anyone who has the research, the data, the passion, Grab that information and go advocate. Be an advocate, not only for yourself, but for others, for the things that you care about. That's the way we help move the needle. And just, you know, personal contact with those leaders. Be brief, informative, concise. They don't have all day, um, but really, you know, hit it home with the data and why this is important. And... This is our information. So these two links are to um, some of our past stuff with the past session, the 87th, and then upcoming two sites, and then contact information for myself, our senior staff attorney, and then our director of public policy and government affairs. And I am pretty positive I'm at time. So that is it. Thank you, though. Thank you, Lindsay. I know that that was a lot of information in 20 minutes. And so if you are interested in learning more about these bills, especially uh, the priorities that are, are going to be coming forward in the 88th legislative session, just send an email to Mr. Volano and he will get it to you. We could also get it to Dr. Lane because I know a large portion of the class is Dr. Lane's class. So we can send that information to you. That way you'll be aware of the bills that are going to be coming up soon. Um, my last speaker is Jacqueline Aludo. She is a warrior in this field and and she has been working for many, many years. She has the cutest little daughter sitting over there. Um, and so Jacqueline is the president of an organization by the name of No Trafficking Zone. You actually heard about her bill, and she'll be going into it in more depth. So Jacqueline, um, she speaks and lectures all over the country, 
to educate and train advocates, public officials, victim service providers, hospitals, faith groups, law enforcement, schools, and government and non-governmental agencies concerning trafficking trends, policing deficiencies, and disparities in solutions to the plight of trafficking. Jacqueline is here tonight to share both her successes at the state level and also at the federal level with the No Trafficking Zone Act. Welcome, Jacqueline. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Rhonda, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. I know you guys have been absorbed with a lot of energy, like a lot of information. I um, am not a lawyer, so my presentation is going to be a little different on how we have been blessed to change legislation um, and not have the same kind of legal team. Uh, so for regular people like me who are passionate about causes and find out when laws um, are so unjust and people are suffering, really anybody can change a law when the right people really come together and work together. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about No Trafficking Zone before I get all passionate. Uh, no Trafficking Zone is a bipartisan uh, nonprofit organization. Our goal is to create no trafficking zones across the world in every community. Uh, the reason being is, is if you want to prevent, combat, and eradicate human trafficking, you need to assess every community, every school, every sports stadium, every place where trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation takes place. Then you have to find out how and why that is happening. A lot of times that is happening because our laws aren't correct. So I'll give you an example. Uh, years ago, no one knew that it was legal to marry a child in the United States of America and in many, many states. Um, that's horrific. Who would think in America that you could be able to marry a child? Uh, when advocates and activists found out and heard what was happening to um, children who were survivors of these forced marriages, they were now going to their states and creating legislation and making child child marriage is um, illegal. And so when people who are passionate, um, advocates, find out about laws, that's when change really happens. Um, and so you need a great team of lawyers uh, like Children at Risk and Street Grace. These are incredible organizations. Um, but you also need frontline people who also really know and understand what is happening and trafficking trends. So with the No Trafficking Zone, we work a lot with uh, child sex trafficking victims. We recover them a lot with law enforcement agencies and families will call us when their children um, have gone missing. We noticed that there was a trend in children now being trafficked on schools and then for the last three decades, so three decades, 30 years of survivors, people in their 40s, saying that when they were first groomed and approached and trafficked, it was on their school campuses. And so we started wondering, how can this happen? Uh, some of them were trafficked during school hours and then were actually brought back to school. And so their parents didn't know. And the reason why that was is because the TEA, how they fund the schools is they take attendance in the morning. And then after a certain time, if you leave school, they no longer take attendance. And so it was easy for um, traffickers to prey on vulnerable youth, blackmail them and exploit them without parents understanding and knowing. And so it's our job to assess all of those uh, situations and then to create laws around them to make sure that this will never happen again and to hold everyone accountable so that we can protect our children. So we had the blessing of uh, creating a uh, a, a law with Senator Taylor and Symphonia Thompson. That's the other thing I want to talk about. Uh, bipartisan is extremely important. We live in an incredibly divided nation, and we cannot protect our children with people on the opposite fi sides fighting. Uh, we all need to come together to protect children in every single community, and every single community as as important. So with the culture of no trafficking zone, we live that, we believe it, and we breathe it. And every single one of our bills has been successful because of that. So Senator Taylor, uh, he authored the bill with us and Rep Thompson carried it. And so this for us was very important because we understood that if we wanted to combat human trafficking, 55% of survivor leaders that took a study said that they were first approached 
groomed, lured, enticed, uh, either on school campuses by a fellow student, they were trafficked and groomed by another student or by a graduating student. And so in the United States, um, juvenile recruiters are very, very popular. I don't know if anyone in here hasn't heard of Jeffrey Epstein, but what, what Epstein did is he targeted trailer parks, uh, very poor, vulnerable girls. He would give them $300 to go to their schools and recruit and groom. It started with one girl, and then in less than a year, it was 82. The problem was is that the school was more worried about uh, liability versus accountability. So it's very easy to label girls who have been raped and sexually exploited as bad girls. They're bad girls. They're doing drugs. Um, these kids are out of control. They're bad kids. And not really finding out the root cause of why is a 14-year-old girl doing drugs? Why was last week she didn't have any money and this week she has a $3,000 purse and her nails are all done and her hair is different? Um, it is our job to really look into that and not place blame on our children and really wonder what is happening in their surrounding areas. Um, we found out that Texas uh, was a high breeding ground and that traffickers and these rings were working very systematically in Texas to groom. Uh, we have survivor leader Courtney Litvak um, in the audience who really talks about how she was trafficked out of Katie ISD and how it really happened. And it was easier for people to believe and blame the girls than to really hold accountable that human trafficking pedophiles, child predators are in your neighborhoods. And putting your head in the sand is not going to make them go away. What is going to make it happen is what happened with the Epstein scandal, was instead of one child being trafficked from a Florida high school, it was 82. So SB 1831 really helped us combat that, where it is now a felony if you try to uh, go, it's a thousand foot circumference on the campus physically, um, if you try to groom, lure, entice, or traffic uh, a youth. And if you, which for me is so important, there's over 7 billion people on the planet that have these cell phones. They all have access now to all of us, especially our youth. And that's how we know that uh, internet trafficking and grooming is very popular on social media, on text messages. And so now if you try to recruit, groom, entice a kid while they're at their schools, you are now breaking SB 1831, the no trafficking zone. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about what Lindsay touched upon with SB 1831, which was um, for, for driving. That wasn't originally a part of our bill. So when you go through the bill process, sometimes they want to add amendments to it. This is a very scary process because if your bill has already passed through the House, every time you add an amendment, you have to go through the whole process. Um, we found out why, what, what had happened, um, why that was so important, and we wanted to add that amendment. And by the grace of God, the whole bill and that amendment was passed. And, and, and again, while you're going through the legislation process, you're going to find out more things and more people that are just as passionate about you, and maybe even issues of how trafficking or what the causes that you're passionate about, you didn't know. Um, we weren't even thinking about, you know, driver's ed. That wasn't even something that we were even uh, focusing on. When we heard about it, it we realized it was very important. Um, what happened with SB 1831, uh, no trafficking school zones, which is so important, was um, met representatives of Congress heard about it at our no trafficking zone summit at NRG Park. And NRG Park, um, we have a summit there every year, and Congresswoman Lee and Congressman McCall said that they wanted to make this a federal bill. The reason why it is so important for this to become a federal bill is when you go before uh, a county and you are a predator, a trafficker, you he you hear on the news and th that traffickers are bonding out of jail and predators and pedophiles. Um, when you go to a federal court, if you are given 25 years, you stay in jail uh, for 25 years. You do the time. Um, there's no getting out on good behavior. There's no bonding out. That is very important for us, um, especially because we see it with um, juveniles and in juvenile detention that our traffickers are bonding out 
However, the victims, the victims in juvenile detention who have committed crimes underneath their trafficker, who don't even identify as victims because they've been given a, a cocktail of drugs to numb them up for how many times they'll be bought and sold in one night um, so that they are so manipulated and so confused, they don't identify as, as victims. So the, certain laws are very important federally. Uh, the other important thing is we need to learn how to create proper prosecutions without victims out crying for many reasons, not just because they don't identify, but because there's a fear of retaliation. Um, we've had young girls who were murdered, um, who were retaliated against, and we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, we want law enforcement to understand that it's not that a victim is not cooperating, it's that a victim is very scared. A victim is very traumatized. And until we put a system together um, that can protect a victim, we need to come up with different ways to prove that this is a victim of human trafficking where it doesn't endanger them and we put predators off the, the streets. Um, another thing that is very important for us is we hear about some of these laws, but the issue is, is you can have laws on the books, but if judges don't manda mandate them, that is a problem. And so we need to create a law where if judges and prosecutors do not uphold the law, they will be held accountable. Uh, because you go through all of this trouble to get a law, and then if prosecutors and judges refuse to do it because they have a political agenda, or they have an ill-intended agenda, or they're just uneducated or unqualified for the job, we really need to make sure then that they are held accountable. We see this happening all the time in juvenile detentions where we have child sex trafficking victims. They're getting offered in Harris County 20 years, 15 years in jail, while their adult predators who bought and sold them um, are getting three years or probation, um, who have never spent a day in jail, bonded out, and kids in detention have been there for over a year. So these are things that are very um, unacceptable. Uh, I know that We've kind of run over time, so I want to keep my time a bit shorter. But any person can change a law if you're passionate about it. Um, it it's really getting together with a group of people, understanding what it's going to take to make a law change. That's what happened with our school zone law. That's what happened now with our bill being in Congress and passing through the House. And if it gets passed through the Senate um, and the president signs it, there'll be uh, no trafficking zones across our nation for schools. And this will disrupt and dismantle child sex trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation by 30%. This will also help us keep a uh, CSAM where we can hold people accountable, which is child sexual abuse material, also known as child pornography, but I really like to say it's um it's crime scene photos. And the reason why it's a crime scene photo is if you take pictures of uh, children in sexual acts or sexually hurting them and exploiting them, that is a crime scene now that you are documenting and you are distributing. And that is also a felony. So we need to change the, the 230 amendment. Uh, we need to really go back with the provision of it. There's a law called the Earn It Act, and I suggest that anyone that's really, really passionate about pedophilia, child pornography, CSAM, uh, we learn about it because it's basically saying that you are, you are allowed to do that, to distribute that content because it takes away your First Amendment rights. Um, and again, these are all things I testified before Congress. I had a bunch of lawyers saying they were going to throw things at me because, believe it or not, there are so many people that don't want the Earn It Act to happen. Um, big tech makes a lot of money off of uh, over-sexualized society uh, and, and violence. And so I was very nervous. Um, but by the grace of God, uh, we did very well. And one of the congressmen who were opposing it then came on and supported it. And it's really talking to your legislators in, in a very human way to say, do you have grandchildren? Do you have a child? Do you have a daughter? Do you know this is what's happening? Um, are we going to care about parties or agendas or are we going to care about humanity? Are we going to put people over profit and parties? Because um, if we're not, then we all need to be held accountable. And that's why changing legislation is so important and getting with the right people who can really, really help you. All you need is a great group of people that want to make a difference, elected officials that, that believe in you and organizations that are behind you. 
and you can do it and you can get it done. Um, if you have any questions, you can email uh, contact at notraffickingzone.org and we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. And uh, please say a prayer for HR 7566, which is the No Trafficking Zone School Act um, for Congress. Uh, if this becomes a, a federal law, we will be able to really protect children a lot more. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jacqueline. We are going to switch over really quick to a panel discussion. And the first question is going to be for all three of y'all. And it is, what is your recommendation? How do the public advocates, students engage the legislative process? You want to go first? Hello? Is this thing on? Yes. <laughs> um, so... There's no real easy answer to this, I don't think. Uh, it requires some work, right? Um, it requires some actual legwork and, and research to do. And it requires a commitment to reach out. Um, I will tell you some, but on the positive side, I will tell you this. Um, if you decide to go to Austin, or you decide to talk to a legislator, you found a bill that you like and you want to follow, they are going to be so appreciative to hear from students. I cannot tell you how they're not always nice to me, but they will be so nice to you. Um, and it's it's it is an exciting thing, and it's uh, it's a fun thing. One thing that um, and I think Lindsay did a great job of breaking down. You know how you interact. They're gonna they're gonna want to hear from you. They're gonna want to talk to you. Um, helpful hint: no, some most people you, you would talk to at Austin are gonna pass the bill or at least worked on the bill. It might be a terrible bill that never ever passed. But if it's human trafficking related, thank them for it. Like, oh, yeah, I saw your bill to put the human trafficking hotline number on all fast food menus. And I know that didn't pass, but, you know, thanks for doing that. It may be a terrible bill, right? But acknowledge that they are in this, that they've done something that they're leading. It makes them feel better. And um, don't feel like you need to explain the issue when you get involved in this either, you know, um, only to the extent necessary. A lot of times they're going to have worked on it. If you want to get involved, though, the most straightforward answer is to just get involved. The easiest path is through your own legislator. Go to open, um, opengovernment.org. Is it OpenGov? I think it is. Um, anyway, just Google who represents me and you'll find it if you don't know. There's no shame in not knowing offhand who your state or senator or rep is a lot. Most Texans don't, right? Um, find out who they are and build a relationship with that office. And if you find that they're receptive to anti-trafficking messages, um, then build from there. And you can actually, you know, the way I look at it, the most effective thing is face-to-face -face contact with, with legislators. Absolutely, number one is face-to-face. -face. Second is actually phone. Um, third is email, and fourth to me is letters. They don't really don't, I don't know how much they really love letters. Um, emails will work if they're not form emails. I, and I'm guilty of doing the form emails, like, oh, my bill's coming up for committee, please send this email to all the committee members. And you know, I've certainly done that, and I will certainly do it again. Um, but if you're writing a genuine email that you've written about the issue, um, that is going to be received and understood and taken as, okay, this is my constituent or at least a Texan. It's not your rep. Um, who cares about this and took the time? This is important. Maybe we should, you know, maybe we should look at this. Just calling your rep up and saying, I want you to support anti-human trafficking. I care about victims. I want, I want you to support anti-human trafficking legislation. It does a lot more good than you think it would because they hear from so few constituents. Constituents they do hear from have a specific problem generally related to their personal lives or their business that they need they need help with from a higher source. To hear about an issue from an individual is a big deal from them, and it puts it on their radar, believe it or not. Now, you know, if you track bills, if you follow bills, you know, there's you can it's like anything, it's like any kind of a hobby, you know. You can get really sucked into it, you know, where you spend a lot of time doing this, but it's really easy to get your feet wet. And the easiest way to do that, I think, is to reach out to your own legislator and find out how easy it is and how human they are, how easy it is to talk to them. And it's one of those things where you're like, oh, well, you know, um, I would, but I don't know enough about the issue and I don't want to look stupid. They don't know that much about the issue either. And you know how I learned about the issue? Looking stupid. That's exactly how I learned about the issue. Going to things, meeting people, talking about it. You know, eventually it just starts to sink in. Mm -hmm. and it won't happen unless you take that first step. So if you're passionate about the issue, I would recommend just to start doing it and see how much you like it. 
and, and if I could add to that, um, if your elected officials aren't listening to you, there's power in people. <laughs> See, your elected officials are there because you voted them in. And so if people are suffering and you're suffering and you're a woman and you don't feel like you have women rights or you're a child and you don't feel like you're being protected, um, petitions, 10,000 people, 100,000 people, that's, that's going to get their attention. Um, a social media campaign, a media campaign, um, all of those things now, we live in a world where as bad as technology has done, it does incredibly good things where we now have the power to hold our elected officials accountable and make ourselves be heard even when they don't want to listen to us. I would add that if you don't want to get super involved as far as the amount of work that goes into it, there's tons of young professional organizations that collectively come together and already have items that they're interested in that you can help support. Go to the organizations that you're interested in and that you see doing great work and look at what they're posting because on social media, they're tweeting about this. They're putting you know stories up on what legislation is going on, if they're having a rally or if there's a protest happening, if they're wanting you to call your representative. They're putting that out there and they're telling you and there's links and easy ways to do it with already a pre, you know, written out message of this is what you need to say and tell them you want this to pass or that you're against this issue because this is what our organization is supporting on human trafficking. And so I do encourage you to look at all those organizations because they really do have great and easy tools to use during the legislative session as well. Thank you. So do we have any questions from the floor? Anybody in the audience that wants to ask a question? Jessica? I have a question. Um, if you have a bill and it dies, can you give it CPR and bring it back next session or? So the question that Jessica asked is if you have a bill and it dies, what can you do to revive it? it coming back and being persistent every session? There's a couple of ways to handle it. Um, one is by Christmas treeing another bill, and the other bill, there's no there's no prohibition on bringing bills forward as many times as you want. The 2803 that Lindsay mentioned and went through very well, um, that was brought a third time. And finally, it passed, and then the governor vetoed it. So, you know, that's how that goes. But no, you can absolutely bring it back next session. A lot of times, if I have a bill that um, didn't make it, you know, I'll work, I try to work with the office, because generally it's an office that opposes it. Maybe the attorney general didn't like it, or maybe a lot of the group didn't like it, or and legitimate reasons. I'm not, you know, find out what their concerns are, and can that be addressed in the bill without destroying the substance of the bill is a good thing to spend the interim doing. You know, a lot of times I feel like people don't do that. They just, and I've been guilty of it too. They just, oh, there's the same thing again, working with the other, address those concerns. But you can also, and this happens a lot, um, towards the end of session, when things are becoming just spinning totally out of control, it looks like that bill is going to make it. Um, if they have friends with the bill, all, the bill sponsor for that bill, they're going to try to tack their dead bill. If it's at all germane, yeah. it has to be germane. So it has to be the same, more or less the same. There's no definition of it, but it has to be sort of the same. Um, they'll try to tack it on there, and you'll see successful bills become a Christmas tree, um, where anything that's germane, people are, oh, this this baby, this, this horse is going to win the race. Let's get something on there. <laughs> Um, so that's another way that it can happen in that session, right? And I've had that happen to bills that have had it happen to my bills, and I've done it to other to other bills, my, or I haven't, but the legislative sponsor did. And so that's, you know. On my statute of limitations bill, that's exactly how it happened. We had a standalone bill in the 79th legislature. It got sent down to a subcommittee, which that's basically death. And so, of course, it died. The next go around in the 80th, I could not find an author for my bill. It actually got amended on the House floor during debate onto Jessica's law. I don't know if y'all remember Jessica Lunsford. She was a young girl who was um, abducted from an absconded sex offender from Georgia. She lived in Louisiana, and she was raped and buried alive. And so Mark Lunsford, her father, went throughout the country trying to change these laws to put stricter penalties in for perpetrators. And so we, on the House floor, um, we added my abolition of the statute of limitations on child sexual assault on that bill, and it sailed through. So all that stuff does happen. Um, Mr. Villano, you said we have a question from online? Yes. How do you know which laws will help prevent human trafficking without loopholes? 
how do you know which laws will help human trafficking without loopholes? I'll throw that to the attorneys. Um, the best answer is workshopping, right? And that's going, so if this is a bill that, it's, if, it's a, if, it's a, if it's a bill that enhances or changes criminal penalties, I want to talk to prosecutors and I want to talk to the attorney general's office. Yeah. And if they don't like it, generally speaking, I don't like it. Because they're the folks who have to use it every day. I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm a, at best, I'm a civil lawyer. I'm really, I'm really not even a lawyer anymore. I'm, and so I'm not using this, right? But there are people who actually have to go in and prove this stuff up. So I want to do the things that are going to help them. I want to maybe push them. I want to push them a little bit to be like, let's consider some new things. But that's one way. And if it's a civil bill or a bill that affects some other code, you find the relevant parties. If it's an education bill, well, there's a lot of parties with, who are going to be affected by this that I want to talk to. Um, to make sure we're accomplishing the goals. And that's all you really can do. And I would say there is no, you can avoid, loopholes aren't as much as worried about as unintended consequences. You know, um, okay, we made this bill to protect survivors, but actually it, it takes away, a, uh, or leaves them vulnerable or adds a vulnerability we didn't see. That's the sort of thing that keeps me up at night, right? Yeah. We passed a bill, but oh gosh, we didn't think this through. You know, having that happen keeps me up at night. That's what I'm most, that's what I'm mainly concerned yeah. about. Um, and the only way you can do that is by gaming it out with all of the parties who would be influenced by this bill. And even then, you know, it's no guarantee, but you can be as thorough as possible. And I would also add, no piece of legislation is perfect. There will yeah. always be exceptions. We live in, again, we live in an imperfect world, and legislation is imperfect. Yeah, if I could quickly add on that. So sometimes there's loopholes or something you didn't see that's a good thing. Um, I'm like Jamie. I'm up at night talking with survivors, legislators for SB18, AG's office, uh, our bill in Congress, meeting with so many different lawyers. The, the worst fear is, will this hurt victims? Um, and you just don't know sometimes because lawyers for uh, predators, they exploit the law. Um, but with SB1831, we, we had an incredible thing happen. The AG's office sued TikTok um, because they wrote a message to a child in school um, on on TikTok, and we actually didn't uh, really understand that grasp of that, and we were like, "Wow, this is great! We're going to be able to hold more social media platforms accountable." And so, I guess with legislation, you just really try to dot all your eyes, cross your T's, talk to everybody, meet with all the proper people. Really, not just the AG's office, prosecutors, lawyers, organizations, um, and survivors, and find out what do you see in this bill that we're missing. What, what, because the worst fear is um, victims being re victimized. And then I have another question here. How do you get back to declarations such as Operation Lone Star, issued by Greg Abbott, affect human trafficking in Texas and abroad? Can you ladies pick this one? <laughs> uh, I think. Um, there can always, as was just mentioned, there can always be unintended consequences that come about from different policies and programs. And I think just like there are with most everything, there's some unintended consequences that have come about with that um, particular policy. And I do think it's something that people are really working on trying to address and finding, trying to find a solution and making sure that there isn't anything that's falling through the cracks in terms of trafficking and really looking at the intersection of immigration and trafficking and what can be done. And so there are a number of conversations that are happening between organizations that are experts in both of those areas and really trying to find a solution to make sure that we're not creating additional survivors or re-victimizing people. Thank you, Lindsay. We have one more question right here. Go ahead. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to let your mama handle that one. Jacqueline? 
Okay. So, um. first of all, how do you define a victim? What is a victim? And if you are receiving texts, if you're getting information that's scary, negative, bullying, and if nobody knows and you're going through that alone, then how can anything good happen out of it um, if nobody knows it's happening to you? Okay. So um, that was a very good question. Uh, my definition of what a victim is, is someone who is really being um, exploited, taken advantage of. We understand what human trafficking, it's, it's force, fraud, or coercion. Um, but those are just three, three words. Uh, there's a lot that goes into force, fraud, or coercion. Um, there's so many different ways to traffic someone and victimize someone. Um, and it's really harming someone uh, to their detriment. Uh, even when they don't know that they're being forced, um, it's exploiting them. Uh, and, and it's creating a lifetime of trauma. And uh, there's one thing I want to talk about trauma with when you talk about what is a victim. Uh, and so we always talk about being trauma-informed, but are we really trauma-responsive? And, and I think that this is a good question for what is a victim because uh, we don't understand what a victim is uh, in in law enforcement and sometimes with NGOs because victims don't look like what we want them to be. They don't have cute pigtails and bows saying, please help me. Um, a lot of times they're telling you, get out of my face. Uh, I'm not a victim. Leave me alone. Um, I hate the police. I hate advocates. And it's really because they are so scared. Um, they don't even know that they're victims. And the ones that they, they, they do, is very hard to identify as a victim. Um, it's really... Um, exploiting people's vulnerabilities and, and crushing them. So that's how I would identify as a victim. And as far as if someone's texting someone inappropriate messages, a child, and we don't know, there are red flags and indicators um, that parents really need to know about. There is an app called Bark. It, it really is incredible where uh, if your ch child is getting content that should not be on there, whether it's CSAM or very inappropriate messages, it alerts um, the parents and it also alerts schools. And so those are uh, two ways that um, I would personally, that would be my opinion. Thanks, Jacqueline. For those that don't know, CSAM is child sexual abuse material. It was formerly called pornography, but now we are calling it by CSAM. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. In closing, we want to, you hear all this information, you wonder what can you do? So trafficking victims are in our communities hidden in plain sight. We need to learn the signs, educate yourself in your community, spread the word, Report, know where to report. So if that child is a victim, you would be reporting to DFPS. If it's an immediate emergency, call 911. Remember, we have the National Human Trafficking Hotline. It's 1-888-373-7888. Over there on the far right is a QR code. That QR code is to a book list that I have ongoing, which is an Amazon wish list. If you could take a picture of that, um, and then it won't, when you get home, you'll be able to scan it to see all the books to help you understand sex trafficking, human trafficking more. That QR code is also found outside, right on the resource table. And so I say do something. How can you do something? Over the course of these three days, we've had about 15 nonprofits come and speak to us. There is room for you to do work in human trafficking. Look over these websites, understand what these organizations are. I'm a true believer that if each of us individually works on one aspect of human trafficking, collectively together we can move mountains. Um, I can't believe this is day three. We're finally at the end of the, of the series. And I want to say a special thank you for Mr. Volano for giving me the opportunity to put together all of these speakers. We do have... Oh, Clap. <laughs> we do have a giveaway tonight, but first I'm going to put up here a survey QR code. Please take the survey. Tell us what was good, what was bad, what, what you would like to see change. Um, and on the giveaway, um, Becca Carey with Hands of Justice, she wrote a book or compiled a book, and it was a book of 20 survivor stories. She took their stories and then she sent those stories out to artists, and artists drew photographs from their stories. The picture to my right is what the artist drew of my story as a survivor of sex trafficking. And so we're going to be giving away two of those books tonight. And so who has the birthday closest to today's date, October 19th? Monday. Monday. Okay. 
And then the other person will be, so January 11th is National Human Trafficking Awareness Day. So whose birthday is closest to January 11th? What's yours? March. What's yours? No, no. March is the closest to January 11th. Okay, then you will get the second book. And so with that, um, have a good evening and thank you for joining us tonight.